more about what happens behind the scenes when it comes to weather forecasts. Yes, so the first problem if you want to forecast what is the weather going to be in five days time or ten days time mm -hmm. is you have to know what the weather is doing now. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in forecasts five to ten days in advance, for example for Europe, you need to be knowing what's happening in the atmosphere over the US and over the Pacific. So when I say we need to know the state of the atmosphere right now, we need to know the state over the entire globe. Mm -hmm. Once we have the, and what we call the initial state of the atmosphere, we use a computer simulation of the atmosphere to predict how that state will evolve forwards in time. Now, if I'm holding a ball and I drop a ball, I know the laws of physics and I can predict where that ball is going to be. Right. I can solve the mathematical equations. The atmosphere is completely the same. It is governed by the physics of, of radiation and momentum, energy transfer, etc., etc. And we have mathematical equations to do that. And we solve those mathematical equations inside a gigantic supercomputer right. to try and take that initial state of the atmosphere, which we know now, forwards in time to some state in the future. So we'll be looking at land observations and observations from the air and also the sea as well. So how many observations will tend to go into the forecast? So the observations we use are, as you say, from aircraft, mm -hmm. balloons, surface measurements. Yes. But remember, for medium range weather forecasting, mm -hmm. we need to know the entire global weather. Yes. So the primary observation source for that is satellites. Satellites, okay. Currently in space above us, we have in excess of 30 dedicated meteorological satellites, right. which are generating hundreds of millions of observations every hour. Mm -hmm. And those observations are piped from all over the world here to ECMWF and they're assimilated in our supercomputer and they drive our forecast model mm -hmm. for predictions. Okay. And how many calculations can those supercomputers perform uh, per second or minute? So our supercomputer has a rating of around 10 petawatts right. and typically that's the equivalent of maybe something like a hundred thousand desktop computers. So it's a very very powerful machine. Very powerful. Okay. So you can see Tropical Storm Irma, that became Hurricane Irma. This is our forecast in the top panel heading towards the Caribbean where it caused a lot of damage there and in the US and Florida afterwards. You can see the storm being born near those islands on the west coast of Africa. They're called the Cape Verde Islands. They're traditionally where these storms have their origins. And we're looking at a time period of about 10 days for this storm to cross the Atlantic from Africa and to hit the Caribbean. Now the Cape Verde Islands is in the, in the um, Atlantic Ocean, away from any big observation networks. The only observations we have of the atmosphere in that location are satellites. They're the only things that can monitor that area constantly in real time. So the bottom panel shows you what happens if we deliberately run our forecasting system where we took out the satellites. We pretended that the satellites were not available. And you can see instantly that there is no observation of the storm. And as the days carry on, our system does not pick up any evidence or any observational information on that storm. And so without the satellites, we could have given absolutely no warning of Hurricane Irma to those islands in the Caribbean and onwards to Florida. So it's an illustration that these satellite observing systems, they're absolutely critical to do what we call medium range forecasting, particularly for severe weather events which happen over the ocean. And every year it's not an overstatement to say that these satellite systems help save tens of thousands of lives. This is more of the same. So this is a two other storms. So one is called uh, Tropical Storm Mankut, which caused a huge amount of devastation to the Philippine Islands in 2018. On the left-hand panel we have uh, Tropical Cyclone Florence, which became Hurricane Florence. As the storms move out of the tropics, they become hurricanes and they get called hurricanes. And it's more an illustration of the same thing, that we are always trying to prove um, uh, what is important for our forecasting system, which observations are critical. And this is again an example of when we deliberately withdraw these satellite observations to see can our forecasting systems, just using aircraft and balloons and surface observations, still do a good job of weather forecasting? And the answer is absolutely no. It illustrates how critical these satellite observations are. And if we look at Mankut, on the right hand side, again, this massive tropical storm in the Pacific, we would have had no knowledge of the storm's existence and no warning given to these people to evacuate the Philippines Islands at all. 
And so again, it's an illustration that these, without these satellite observations, global weather forecasting, and particularly the forecasting of severe weather events, becomes impossible. Can we chat about ensemble forecasting? Yes, so obviously our forecasts are incredibly important to give out to our users. Mm -hmm. But actually a forecast on its own without any estimate of uncertainty is not particularly helpful. Imagine for a moment that you are the mayor of New York in 2012 and you get a telephone call saying that there's this storm called Hurricane Sandy mm -hmm. and it's going to crash into Manhattan mm -hmm. in six days time. Bear in mind that this has never happened before your first question to me would be, am I sure? So when we issue a forecast, we also have to issue some uncertainty information about this forecast to give some reliability so that the people who make decisions whether to evacuate an island or evacuate an area or not have all the information on which to make those decisions because doing incorrect evacuations can be equally hazardous. Mm -hmm. So the way we characterize uncertainty in our forecast is what we call ensembles. And ensemble means that essentially we run the same forecast for the same situation again and again and again. But what we do is we make very small perturbations to the initial conditions and very small perturbations to the mathematical equations that describe the physics. The idea being that some situations, some meteorological situations, are more predictable than others. And by running this ensemble of forecasts, if all of the forecasts say exactly the same story, we have a high degree high of confidence, confidence that that forecast is reliable. Right. If all of these ensemble members, these different forecasts, suddenly diverge rapidly yes. and give and very different stories, then the confidence goes right down. Mm -hmm. It sounds a very simple principle, but it's an incredibly powerful way to give our users not just a good forecast, but some information about how accurate that forecast is in advance so they can make good decisions. In terms of model resolution, what's the highest? So currently we model the atmosphere, we break the globe up into a grid mm -hmm. and each grid spacing is roughly nine kilometers apart. Nine kilometers. Okay. And at every grid point we model the atmosphere in three dimensions, so vertically up to a height of 80 kilometers. Okay. So you can see that um, the number of grid points, if you like, that we are operating on mathematically and the number of grid points that we are predicting for the weather yeah. is a mind-boggling number of locations nine kilometers apart, up to 80 kilometer altitude over yes. every spot on the globe. Yes, very fast. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit about the computer capability here? Yes, we have a very large computer yes. uh, because we have a very large simulation problem to solve right. that produces the forecasts. Okay. And the computers here get upgraded every four years? Yes, roughly. I mean, we sometimes have slightly longer contracts. It depends a okay. bit on the availability of funding, but also the co computing needs that we actually right. have. And an important factor is actually, actually the readiness of technology. So okay. if there's a new processor technology coming around, we want to make benefit from that, and so we want the latest technology that we can afford for the money. Okay. And what's happening here at the moment, and any kind of future plans that you have when it comes to the computers? Well, one thing is that we're procuring for a new machine right now. Okay. Uh, so we actually have, uh, we're close to signing a contract with our next provider for the machine. Okay. The machine is going to be in Bologna. Uh, that's a, a big difference for us because uh, implementing a machine in the same place or in a different place is uh, a, whole, a, a totally, totally different story. And the other thing is that uh, because we are very, have very ambitious science plans, so to upgrade our forecasting system, better resolution, more complex models, okay. more uh, ensembles, uh, we need to find ways to calculate uh, the, uh, the science more effect efficiently on, on technology. And that's a big bit tricky right now because technology is not going to help us anymore as it used to be in the past. Uh, so we really have to change our way and our approach to how we map our science problem onto a computer. And it's, that's research actually. Okay. And what do you see happening in the future in terms of the models for the ECM? Um, I guess uh, it will change in a similar way as in the past. You know, we, we kind of know the directions of research that we need to undertake to improve forecasts. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to do that for the entire system, you know, from, from the forecast for tomorrow uh, to the forecast to the seasons with one single change. So it's a very complex interplay of scientific changes. 
but uh, it's still the big things like spatial resolution counts. You know, if you uh, have better spatial res uh, uh, resolution, you represent processes in more detail. Okay. You want complexity because you know that the land surface of the ocean interacts with the atmosphere, for example, mm -hmm. or that aerosols in the atmosphere are important. Yes. And then we want a lot of ensembles uh, because uh, bigger ensembles means a better prediction of extremes. Yes, and you can display how confident you are then when you've got ensembles. That's right. Okay. And for extremes, because you sit, you know, you, 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 what you predict is you predict the probability distribution of possible scenarios of weather. Mm -hmm. And in the tails of these distributions, there are your extremes. So yes. the more ensemble members you ha you have, the better you represent these extremes. Yes. And that's in that's one of our key missions actually to have a proof prediction of extremes. Right. What's one of the difficulties when it comes to modeling? Um, it's different. It's different things at different levels. Mm -hmm. So there are still many processes that we don't understand. So yes. we really do not know the science behind it, and it's complicated. It's it. You have very small scales interacting with large scales. Uh, many of the things we can't even measure, so we don't know that. So we have to make approximations. Uh, another uh, critical point is that because we have limited resolution, uh, even if we know small scale processes, mm -hmm. we can't explicitly represent them in models, so we have to approximate as well. And that hurts, you know. Approximations are simplifications and that causes errors. Yes, yeah, the atmosphere is a very chaotic system. That's right. It? And as you heard earlier, you know, in the initial conditions are very important. So yes. where we start the forecasts, uh, for which we use a lot of observations, is very important as well. And in those initial conditions, there can be errors, can't there? When it comes there to are the errors. Uh, yeah. So one thing is to mm -hmm. know your errors, so that right. you can explicitly represent them in your ensemble predictions, because mm -hmm. that's also an error source that we try to represent. Yeah. At the same time, we want to reduce these errors with better observations, but mm -hmm. also with, uh, by exploiting the existing observations in a better way. Uh, and that requires very complex mathematics and again a good model. Okay. Do you plan to have more sites with more observations in the future? Um, it's probably a lot more of the same okay. uh, in terms of observation types, mm -hmm. like we use a lot of satellites for example, yes. mm -hmm. so there will be more satellites, there will okay. be more complex instruments uh, on satellites, so right. we need to make sure that we can uh, use the information coming from that. There's a lot of very important information coming from stations as well, balloons and buoys. So that's yes. still a lot of the same, but more and probably better, better instruments. That's good. Okay. Um, but then in the not too distant future, we will see entirely new observations coming, for example, from mobile phones, from car sensors. You know, oh, wow. uh, and so it's an entirely different observing system then, where okay. we have no experience whatsoever. Okay. So we have to learn how to use that. You know? okay. well, thank you so much for chatting to me. It's yes, very interesting. Thank you.